at uh, five minutes after two. We are going to join Andy Raymond uh, from across the ditch. Andy, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Mr Telfer. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, OK, the Football World Cup, I suppose it's still getting plenty of airtime, as we say, in the business. Yeah. But I imagine the big story in this week in Australia, particularly the football story, has to be this ongoing saga around the pitch invasion in Melbourne last week at the Derby. I heard one prominent uh, football of, uh, player in Australia, ex-player, I can't think who it was now, called it the most disgraceful day in Australian football. What say you? most disgraceful day in Australian sport. I'll take it a step further. Um, there's no place for that. It, it, it's not about sport. It's about uh, very average people doing very average things. Uh, and that the sad part, you know, we've got a sporting bias to every conversation we have. The really sad part is the game progressed so much, mate, over the last month. It really did. And there would have been parents looking at putting little Johnny into a, a, a football competition this winter and, and maybe not looking at rugby union or rugby league. And it was going to be a big challenge. Uh, such momentum on the back of the Socceroos. And this has just, it's tarnished the game. It's given it a black eye that it is going to be very difficult to recover from. But just uh, frightening scenes. Would you ever take anyone uh, as a guest to an A-League game again. And I know that's suggesting the majority are in the wrong, and I don't mean to suggest that, but I'm not going to get caught up in that, and I'm not going to be responsible for anyone else getting caught up in that. It was just horrific, mate. And, and it's not about who they allegedly support. It's not about which country their grandparents came from. Again, it goes back to good people and bad people, and there's both in society, and this is the bad people on a huge stage that have, um, oh, jeez. The more I think about it, the worse it is. But they've, they've tarnished the game no end. And so I think I'm right in saying that the Melbourne City program for the rest of the season, uh, well, they will play their matches without any fans in attendance, right? That's part of the penalty. I'm just looking at uh, at everything now. I was, I was just uh, taking a peek at... Uh, the fact that Melbourne Victory, uh, you know, they've submitted their reply to the show cause notice issued to the club. Um, the severity, severity of the consequences still very cloudy. There's a lot of prominent people um, in the media. There's prominent people in the game itself, both current and former that are calling for the harshest of penalties mm. to both uh, the individual and the club. Um, and I, I think you've got to set an example. I, I really do, mate. And, and that's horrible, the, the fact someone can't go and, and, and watch a, a, a game of sport, essentially, but you can't have these people at a game. And it, look, it doesn't matter what game it is. It doesn't matter if it's the cricket at the MCG on Boxing Day or it doesn't matter if it's a, a you know victory game at, uh, over the road. It, just unacceptable. Yeah, it was almost like watching that vision of those players invading the pitch and, pitch and their goalkeeper tossing the flares back into the crowd. It was like we're going back into the future. It reminded me of sort of kind of that yeah. old footage of, that we saw in the 70s and 80s uh, at football grounds, particularly all across Europe and Britain, a good example, in England. Um, and I thought, oh my God, this is extraordinary. This is something from 30 years ago that 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 cut this kind of virus out of football and suddenly it's flared up again and back it is. And um, I just made a little comment at the top of our show today that um, the New Zealand team in the A-League, the Phoenix, have just gone underground. They've gone positively subterranean on this. They won't talk about it. Wow. They're, they're claiming that it's nothing to do with them. It's all about the A-League. And yet I'm thinking, uh, I've been waiting and trying to see this week here the Phoenix officials assuring mums and dads who take their kids to the Wellington Stadium yeah. on a Sunday afternoon that they've beefed up security, the ground and the pitch will be secure. You're not going to finish up in hospital like a couple of unfortunate people did who went to that match last Sunday. But not a word, not a word at all from anyone. And I'm thinking, if I had young kids, would I w would I be wanting to take them to a would I want to take them to an A League match at the moment? I don't think so. 
Absolutely not. That's really interesting that uh, that your your boys have, or not the not the players, but the the club has has gone underground. Um, it's an opportunity to be proactive. I'm a bit concerned. I've got to say about the copycat mentality. Um, is this the start of unacceptable, unruly behaviour? Uh, a little story. We, uh, as a family, when I was a, a young bloke, we travelled to the US regularly, and uh, we, we'd do it almost annually for a couple of weeks. And you would watch the news over there, and it was drive-by shootings, and it was gang violence, and it was stabbings. And you would often say to your parents, thankfully, we live in Australia. Thankfully, we don't hear and see any of this stuff. Well, sure enough, you know, 30 years later, that's what dominates the six o'clock news every night in Australia and New Zealand, these, these horrific stories. But what I'm doing is linking it in. This is the type of behaviour and the type of stuff that I grew up watching from overseas. And you, and you thought, how do they get onto the field? How do they get flares into the game? Mm, Who mm. are these people? And it's happening in our own back door. Mm. I mean, just, it's crazy. This is stuff you see on the news. Wow, lucky I'm not part of that. Well, we are part of that, and it's, it's very disappointing, mate. Yeah, well, I imagine it'll, the A-League continues this weekend. It'll be very interesting to see whether the crowd numbers are down because of what happened last Sunday. I've got no idea. Uh, I have a, Well, I have a suspicion that they probably will be down because a lot of families might be thinking twice about taking their kids to an A-League football match, which uh, a week ago would have seemed like a preposterous kind of reaction. Oh, I'm not taking my kids to AMI Park. Uh, there could be a pitch invasion. Um, but now... It's hey, happened. Brendan, from a, uh, from a corporate perspective, this is going to damage the game as well. You know, from a business standpoint, I can see sponsors bailing out Absolutely. of the game. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, w- without any doubt whatsoever over the next couple of months, just saying, look, we don't want to be involved in this type of thing. A lot of, a lot of uh, big companies, uh, I mean, a majority of big companies don't want to have anything to do with combat sports. They, t- they term them fight sports. They, they won't sponsor, they won't embrace because it's a, a negative look on their brand. That's how they see it. Well, this, this is even worse. This, is, this makes boxing and MMA and UFC and everything else look pale by comparison because there's rules there and there's governing bodies and there's regulations. This is just outlaws. And if it's if it's my company, if uh, if Tel- Telford Raymond Enterprises was <laughs> going well, mate, and we were tipping in half a million dollars a year to the A-League or to one of the clubs, I would have pulled it by now. Yeah, well, you would know from uh, your, your time observing uh, comings and goings in uh, Rugby League in Australia that every any time there's a scandal um, involving a club, uh, the first actions are always the sponsors usually bang That's they right. fold their tent and go they do not want to be associated with and sometimes yeah. i think a lot of these corporates are overreacting and are being a bit precious but that's the mentality they, that they don't want to be anywhere near the sniff of scandal and now if you were a major sponsor of the a-league you'd be having meetings this week i imagine around your boardroom table what do we do where do we go do we pull yeah. the pin yeah, you, you reckon the communications and sponsorship manager at, at a dozen cl- a dozen companies in Australia <laughs> is getting a talking to from the C- from the CEO at the moment? Yeah, Why yeah. did you sign with this mob? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, let's uh, have... very, very disheartening in the fact that they've uh, they, they've not just halted the momentum the Socceroos created; they've destroyed it. The, the World Cup and Australia's part in the World Cup is basically forgotten already. Okay, let's move on to some other things. I see there's a bit of a post-mortem going on about the pitch that was used up at the Gabba for this first test between, or this test between the, um, um, the Windies... Australia and, and South Australia, Africa. Uh, sorry, in South Africa, yes, yeah, yeah. sorry. The Windies have gone yeah. all over inside two days. And now uh, I noticed some of the, the commentators, the television commentators were saying during the match, they weren't being too critical. Uh, you don't expect them to be putting the boot in, but uh, they were suggesting that this was just the ground staff might have just overcooked the pitch a bit in favour of the bowlers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you've got arguably the two best sides in world cricket going at a test match. It's over inside at two days. Just, it's not acceptable. I do note that ICC match referee, the great Richie Richardson, said last night or maybe early this morning 
Uh, he's rated the Brisbane pitch below average. Um, the Gabba received one demerit point under the ICC pitch and outfield monitoring process. Uh, yeah, too much in favour of um, of the bowlers and, and not enough the you know the, the batsmen. Mm. What a real disappointment! We've just gone through a, a, the most anticlimactic and lacklustre and boring test se- two test series against the Windies. Everyone was looking forward to this, and it's just ended miserably. There's no win. The Australians won, but there's no win in this for anyone. Mm. It's hard to believe when you think about it that you get four innings completed in a test match between two two top countries inside two days. Um, Crazy. Uh, a, a lot of focus now going on uh, the Melbourne cricket ground, mate. Yeah, um, yeah, for the Boxing know, Day test. A, mm. Yeah, that that was a a green top last year, and it was said to be too favourable towards the bowlers, not enough the batsmen. I I, I just wonder if. If plans are changing, if they're going to be reactionary, if they're going to turn it round completely and you know favour favour the batsman, we we might end up with a with a grey pitch on day one with not a sight of green, and we might go five days in the most boring draw of all time. We, yeah, we don't get too many draws in Test cricket anymore, do we? I mean, look at that series in Pakistan, um, uh, the Poms sweeping Pakistan three 0 I read this morning it was the first time. Any visiting cricket team to Pakistan has swept the home side. So, again, this remarkable transformation with English cricket. Uh, can't wait for this. I think I said to you last week, can't wait for this Test Series uh, or the Ashes Series next year. Uh, it, let's move on to a couple of rugby league stories or a rugby league story around a couple of signings. I see um, my dear producer, um, Lachlan, tells me you're a big Eels fan. I see they've re-signed the, the Kiwi lad, uh, Dylan Brown, this week. Good news. Yeah, 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 that is terrific news. It's a, it's essentially a long term contract, and Dylan has really, uh, he, him and his management team have thought this through. It's an unusual contract in the fact that there's a couple of years at the start of it, and then there's two periods in which he can either step out or continue on with, and it's a huge vote of confidence for the coach, Brad Arthur, and I think the Eels would be very nervous and perhaps very silly to even remotely look at Brad Arthur's contract as a, as a head coach anytime soon. You don't want to disrupt the superstars. You don't want to disrupt the team. Uh, and Dylan, a uh, good young Kiwi kid and a wonderful young fella away from rugby league as well, mate, has uh, made a huge decision, profitable decision as well. Uh, it means the Dolphins continue on without their marquee signing and it also puts the pressure on Mitchell Moses mm. and uh, what he does with the Parramatta Eels there's been uh, there's been more this morning here with the fact that uh, Cody Walker and Latrell Mitchell um, hot on the heels of, of Damian Cook have um, basically pledged their allegiance uh, to the South Sydney Rabbitohs so Having those three guys all locked up, that uh, means the Rabbitohs are, are going to be quite something. I think Latrell is going through until the end of 2027. Cody is a couple of years younger. And really interesting to note, when Latrell is up for contract, uh, historically his last two contracts, when he's up for contract, he, I think it plays on his mind a little bit. And I think it does affect his football. And we're talking big numbers, so rightfully so. So the fact he's got a bit of stability off the field, maybe a little bit more flair on the field, that's a that's a big win for Souths. Mm. Uh, back here, uh, there's been a bit of interest raised in the decision of the Warriors to let Ben Murdoch uh, Masile go. He, I think, was a big signing last year. Had a few injury problems this year, or this year with the Warriors. And the word is that he's probably going to go to the Dragons. Is that your read? Yeah, absolutely. Ben Murdoch Masilla to uh, to the St George Illawarra Dragons. They they really need him. Uh, I think over the next couple of weeks, and I'll say probably up until the end of January, I think there's going to be a lot of movement uh, in terms of players. I don't think Ben Murdoch Masilla is going to be the last one by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the Rugby League Players Association and the NRL are yet to come up with what the salary cap is for next season. So 
clubs at the moment are, are currently stuck in a holding pattern, if you like. They're, it's like the plane circling Auckland Airport. They they want to get there, but they can't get there because they don't know where the runway is. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be interesting. And when they finally do come up with the salary cap number, whatever that may be, some clubs are going to go into panic mode and some clubs are going to be sitting there smiling like a Cheshire cat thinking, okay, we've got a bit of coin. Who are we going to mm, go after? Mm. Uh, so I think there's going to be a, a lot more changes uh, over the next, say, five weeks. Where does the salary cap sit at the moment? What's it at? Oh, off the top of my head. No, you, you've got me. I, I'd be guessing. Seven, be seven or eight million guessing. or something, is it? Yeah, it's... Yeah. it's I think it might even be a little more than, than eight. I've okay. 9.2 sticks in my head at, okay. at the moment, but uh, I've never been good with numbers either, my friend. Uh, well, they'll probably round it off to an even neat 10 million maybe, but um, yeah. uh, we'll we'll wait and see. It's the other interesting thing about this business, and just going back to where we started from about this pitch invasion, it's kind of the backstory is this opposition to the idea that these uh, next three A-League finals are all going to be played at the... A Sydney Football Stadium or a stadium in Sydney, yeah. um, and yet we've had this sign of fans at various matches. I think at Perth and, of course, obviously at Melbourne, and also at the Phoenix match last week of protesting uh, silently yep. in Wellington and Perth, just walking out of the uh, ground. But it's come to come to pass that the owners of these clubs, like the Phoenix and uh, probably Perth and maybe one, maybe not the Melbourne clubs, but apparently eight yep. of the 11 or 12 clubs in the A-League um, have signed on to this deal and endorsed this deal yep. of, of going to Sydney for three years. And so they're taking the money and in agreeing to go to Sydney while their fans are protesting and walking out of the games. <laughs> it's a bizarre it's kind of... It's funny, they've been yeah. very, very quiet about that fact, the clubs. They've been very, Absolutely. very quiet. Yeah. Yeah. They've, uh, they've, 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 ver- they've gone to ground mm. um, and they're, they're refusing to put uh, a positive spin on, on what it means for the game as a whole. Whether you agree with it or not, they've signed the deal um, and they signed the deal for the betterment of the game for a financial guarantee with the New South Wales government and no doubt with sponsors, et cetera, et cetera. But gee, the clubs have gone very quiet no. on their role in this whole thing, mate. Well, you can understand, I suppose, why they are seeing these fans of theirs marching out of the stadium mounting a silent protest <laughs> and they yeah. can hardly criticise them or they can hardly support them. But um, the other thing here, which also is a bit murky from one or two people we've spoken to here this week, is that the owners that are getting the $10 million or the clubs, um, I have a feeling it might be the owners of the clubs that have been the people that have instigated this d- this deal with Sydney Stadium. So that's uh, my understanding yeah. of it. It's it's the owners, owners of yeah, the, the clubs, clubs yeah. and then and then the the owner gets to make the decision. Mm. I guess, like any business, how much of that gets funneled into his personal bank account and how much gets funneled exactly. into the club. And uh, one of the uh, uh, prominent fo- ex footballer that we spoke to here on the air this week said uh, one of the reason why the, a lot of these fans are upset is because the club themselves and the members of the club were never consulted about this. It was a decision taken around a board table among the owners and eight of them apparently were in favour of it. So there's a, quite a bit more to play out on this, I suspect, Andy. But anyway, we'll leave it there for today. We'll, so what, do you, what have you got lined up for Christmas? Another holiday to the States? Oh, I wish there was a holiday to the States. No, I'm uh, heading down to Sydney to spend Christmas with my Christmas mad mother and she will be in her absolute element. There'll be singing Santas and toads and lizards uh, all across the house. There'll be a Christmas tree. Um, she still treats me like a seven-year-old, so there'll be a Santa sack there waiting for me in the morning, and I can't wait. <laughs> well, I can tell you an interesting Christmas shopping experience I had today. I went, uh, one of my families, we have this, what is it, Secret Santa? Do you know the Secret Santa? Yes, Everyone yep, buys yeah, yeah. one present. And this year they've made it, the family, nothing much to do with me, made it 50 bucks. So I went to a big department store, I won't name it, and I was looking around there for something else, actually, and I saw these really good noiseless um, headphones for forty nine ninety nine. I thought oh, that's perfect. I'll, I'll buy. That'll do me. And I'll, that'll be my secret Santa. They look quite nice. Yeah. I don't know. Just uh, you know, headphones. 
So I get to the checkout counter and the woman scans the item and says, that's $99.99. And I said, oh, excuse me. No, I said, it's uh, $49. She said, no. She said, I've just scanned it here from the box uh, onto my computer and there it is, $99.99. I said, well, that's not good. I said, because it was definitely $49.99 over on the shelf there. And anyway, she said, well, hold on, let me get one of the managers. And she called a woman down, and the woman said, I'm sorry, sir, that's just a mistake we've made, and I do apologise, but it is $99.99. I said, I don't think that's good enough, really. I said, that's false advertising. She said, oh, I think you might have just read, misread the price. And she said, let, we, let's go over oh, and have a look. Yeah. So we go over, and sure enough, there's only the only figure that we can see anywhere on the shelf above and the shelf below was $49.99. So she turned to me and she said, I tell you, not only am I going to apologise, you can have them for forty nine ninety nine. So oh, my, my my fifty dollar <laughs> secret Santa is going to worth a hundred bucks. And I said to Lachlan, I'm not sure whether I'll put that in this. I might go and buy another secret Santa and keep the headphones myself. But anyway, exactly, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Oh, good stuff, mate. Yeah. And you've got a story to tell sitting round like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, Andy, thank you for your contributions here at the platform this year, and you have a very enjoyable Christmas with your with your mad mother. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun. It'll be great uh, to you and uh, everyone there at the platform, but most importantly to the listeners who, um, who we cater to like nowhere else um, in New Zealand. Uh, I hope you have all had a wonderful year. I hope you've enjoyed the laughs and the giggles that we've had and some of the serious topics as well. Can't wait to uh, get back into your ears in 2023. Thank you, Andy. Yes, uh, the platform will be back on air with uh, Martin and Lachlan on the 16th of January, and I'm sure they'll be lining you up for that first week. Andy Raymond, our Australian correspondent, such good value coming into us from across the ditch.